And all the people that said that we had to worry about the budget deficit, we had to worry about it so much that we had to cut spending on health and education, those same people say we can afford $200 billion worth of company and income tax cuts. So my point, quite simply, is they don't mean it. They're taking the piss. One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Dead, buried, cremated. Australia is basically done for. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. How is it that after 27 years of economic growth and a mining boom, Australia can't afford to fund high-quality rape crisis services or adequate aged care or to tackle climate change? Today we bring you our Chief Economist Richard Dennis at the official launch of his June quarterly essay, Dead Right, How Neoliberalism Aid Itself and What Comes Next. Here's Richard. Um, look, let me start by, uh, by thanking Ben and, and in turn the Australia Institute because literally this essay wouldn't be written without Ben's support and uh, uh, the kind of encouragement you heard uh, for me tonight is the kind of encouragement that gives me the time and the privilege to sit around in tillies all day writing endless books. So, uh, no, they, these things don't just happen. I, I have this incredibly privileged job and it's... Uh, it's because Ben and the Australia Institute support me. So uh, to the Australia Institute and to Ben and, and to everyone here who supports the Australia Institute, thank you. Because, uh, um, yeah, even though my publisher would say it was a bit late, it still it takes a lot of time to write these things and um, uh, it takes a lot of support to have that much time. So, yeah, neoliberalism, uh, does it exist? Uh, of course it exists. Uh, as an idea, it exists. Uh, as an idea, it's had power. But what I argue in the essay is that its real power was the power to conceal raw politics. Neoliberalism has been used to justify all sorts of public policy changes. And indeed, in the essay, I argue some of them are good. To be honest, I don't really care that the Australian government doesn't own Qantas anymore. I don't. They privatised it. Anyone remember Australian Airlines? OK, we used to own that too. And Qantas, which was our international airline, and Australian Airlines, which was our domestic airline, were different airlines and they weren't allowed to cooperate. That was a bit weird. Neoliberalism said that was a bit weird. Why does the government own an airport? Uh, why does the government own uh, an airline? Why does the government own two? Why couldn't you have the same airline do domestic and international? So neoliberalism exists, absolutely. And, and I don't think that everything that was done in the name of neoliberalism is necessarily a bad thing. I don't believe that at all. But what I also don't believe is that as one of the richest countries in the world, living at the richest point in world history, that we in Australia can't afford to have high quality health services, high quality aged care services, high quality education services, or indeed we can't afford to tackle climate change. That's not neoliberalism. It's got nothing to do with neoliberalism. But the, the ideology of neoliberalism has been used with incredible success for 30 years to make people feel scared, to make people feel divided, to make people feel poor. Which is, of course, the ultimate irony I talk about in the essay. On the one hand, they want to brag that nothing has grown the economy more than this neoliberal agenda. 27 years of economic growth. They all want to talk about the economic miracle. But they can't explain why after 27 years of economic growth, we can't afford to do things we could do 27 years ago. And if we can't afford to do it now, when is it? I always think of my kids in the back seat of the car on a long car trip. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? 27 years. Okay, fine, that's not enough. We can't afford, we can't afford to have high quality rape crisis centres in Australia today. We can't afford for everyone to, to retire comfortably. We can't afford to have aged care centres that look after everyone when they're old. 
60% of people in aged care centres suffer some form of malnutrition. In Australia today, 60% of people in aged care are suffering some form of malnutrition. So how many years is it? Is it 30? Is it 33? Is it 37? Is it 54? Are we only halfway there? Neoliberalism, one of its greatest tricks is to say we're the only, we're the only path to prosperity. But of course, all of that pos- prosperity is used as a, again, to conceal the fact that we can't simply afford to do things anymore. So, step one, neoliberalism exists. So, uh, I remember that conversation with Ben. I said, oh, I'm going to write a book about neoliberalism and I think I'm going to argue it doesn't exist. And he did what Ben did, which was just look <laughs> and say anything. So I kept talking. Um, <laughs> so of course it exists, but it doesn't exist in the way we're told it exists. The so-called free marketeers, the so-called small government political parties and business leaders, as Ben said, Tony Shepherd sells himself for 10,000 bucks a speech, sells himself for 10,000 bucks a speech, bragging that no one got more money out of government than him. And he's the guy that literally wrote the Commission of Audit saying government shouldn't do things. But, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We live in a country where we want to subsidise coal mines. Where the free market is, the people we call neoliberal, the people we call free market, the people we call small government, the people we say don't have a vision for the country. Well, they want to subsidise coal mines. Tony Abbott wants to nationalise the electricity sector. And all the people that said that we had to worry about the budget deficit, we had to worry about it so much that we had to cut spending on health and education, those same people say we can afford $200 billion worth of company and income tax cuts. So my point, quite simply, is they don't mean it. They're taking the piss. <laughs> oh, I don't know why you're laughing. Like they're, getting, like they're running the country. They literally say we can't afford to do this when what they meant to say was we don't want to do this. They literally say that's not something government should do because we're busy subsidising coal mines. We, the Gladys Berejiklian, the New South Wales Premier, renowned for being a, a zealot when it comes to the privatisation of assets, recently bought one of these uh, football stadiums that you're talking about. It had been privatised before. She bought it back. The New South Wales government bought a football stadium so that they could spend a billion dollars knocking it down and building it again. But we're calling them neoliberal. Right, we're flattering them unfairly to suggest that they're ideologues. <laughs> it's not a joke. Right? It's a compliment to call them an ideologue. Because I don't like an ideologue is someone that subscribes to an ideology. What's an ideology? A consistent, coherent worldview. It's not an insult to be an ideologue. Right? It's it's a bad idea to apply your ideology inappropriately. But having an ideology isn't problematic. Having a coherent worldview isn't problematic. None of these people have a coherent worldview. And when we call them ideologues, rather than people that would rather spend money on coal mines than sick people, we're not helping ourselves. I'm arguing that we're actually helping them. So, you know, both things are true. Neoliberalism is a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. It's real. It's a set of ideas. But the people that have been allegedly implementing it in Australia uh, don't subscribe to those ideas. They subscribe to a good old-fashioned idea. Give money to your friends, take it from your enemies. They don't hate government spending. They love it on their friends. And they don't hate regulation. Why are they regulating the unions? They don't hate red tape. Why are they trying to regulate the NGO sector? They don't hate red tape. Money is just a tool of their political power. Regulation is just a tool of their political power. When we call them free marketeers who hate regulation, we're not helping explain anything to anyone. I couldn't believe this quote when I, when I was researching the book. We've all heard that Margaret Thatcher said there's no such thing as society. I found a much better quote. 
It's a bit long, but I want to read it to you. This is Margaret Thatcher in 1981. She's talking, when she says the last 30 years, she's talking about post-war Britain. What's it, I can't do an impersonation of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> What's irritated me about the whole direction of politics in the last 30 years is that it's always been towards the collectivist society. People have forgotten about the personal society and they say, do I count? Do I matter? To which the short answer is yes. And therefore, and this is a great you know, debating trick, get people to agree with something simple and change it. And therefore, it isn't that I set out on economic policies. This is Margaret Thatcher, 1981. It isn't that I set out on economic policies. It's that I set out really to change the approach. And changing the economics is the means of changing the approach. If you change the approach, you really are after the heart and soul of the nation. Economics are the method. The object is to change the heart and the soul. It's not top secret. I googled it. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Economics are the method. The object is to change the heart and the soul. Well, credit where credit's due, she did it. No, I mean it. She did it. And she didn't just do it in England, she exported it around the world. Reagan loved it, but she thought it up. She was after the heart and soul of England. And in Australia, conservatives lapped it up as well. And as Ben said, when you go to the War Memorial now, when you walk in, the first thing you'll see is an ad, literally, for Boeing, BAE, Tarlitz. Our war memorial. The other thing that, you know, so if, if conservatives obsess about the economy, the other thing they obsess most about, I would suggest, is, is, is our, our proud military history. Well, our war memorial is sponsored. It's sponsored. The eternal flame in the pond of reflection is brought to you by the gas industry. I'm not kidding. It didn't used to be there. They installed it. It's marketing. Okay, the original War Memorial didn't have an eternal flame. The gas industry, and we thank them for it, and two nice big plaques around the pond of reflection. The gas industry installed a gas burner for us in our War Memorial, and we thank them for it. And to this day, Origin gives us the gas for free. Lest we forget our sponsors. <laughs> well, it's about the heart and soul. We, as one of the richest countries in the world, apparently believe we can't afford to run a war memorial. Apparently we think we can't afford to remember people who died for us. And conservatives, alleged conservatives in Australia, think that it's not only acceptable, but it's desirable to go cap in hand to BHP, who owes us a billion in tax, and thank them for their contribution and put a nice big poster of them up in our war memorial. Because our heart and soul now believes that we can't afford to do simple things like have a war memorial without corporate support. Wonderful marketing. The Westpac Rescue Helicopter. Anyone heard of it? Put up your hand if you think Westpac funded. Oh, no one's everyone's nervous. <laughs> right. It's the New South Wales Ambulance Rescue Helicopter. It's funded out of New South Wales Consolidated Revenue. Westpac bought the naming rights. There's an ad on television with a dad and his son with a capsized yacht in the background and the Westpac rescue helicopter comes and lowers the thing down and the voiceover actually says, and I quote it in here, even though they're not Westpac customers. <laughs> <laughs> We're there for them. <laughs> even though your fucking statutory obligation... <laughs> As the New South Wales Ambulance Service requires you to rescue them. But thank you, Westpac, for taking all of the credit. Right. But they don't, they don't sponsor the domestic violence shelters. Right. 
They don't sponsor the, the, the key infrastructure we need. They sponsor our stadiums. Remember Lang Park? It's not Lang Park anymore. What is it now? Suncorp Stadium. You think Suncorp paid for it? No, it's a billion a year from the Queensland State Government. All right. They sponsor our stadiums, they sponsor our rescue helicopters, they sponsor our arts, they sponsor our war memorials because we can't do nice things without corporate support because after 27 years of continuous economic growth, we're broke. It's genius. It's got nothing to do with small government, but as Margaret Thatcher said, it's all about our heart and soul. User pays, divide and conquer, deregulate, you name it. We've changed the country. We used to be the land of the sickie and the smoko and the long weekend. Now we work some of the longest hours in the Western world with a growing proportion of our population with no sick days, no paid holidays. It's not because we can't afford to do that. It's because neoliberalism's convinced us it's the only way. So I'm going to end on a dreary note. <laughs> I've got a whole bunch of solutions in the back of the book. Uh, but let me just, let me just end uh, with, with a big one. And you, know, you might have heard, I think I'm an economist. Uh, I think economics is important. I do think economics is important. And I love the work that we do here at the Australia Institute to, to critique data economic ideas and put good ones up. But my conclusion really is that the opposite of neoliberalism, the opposite of conservative economics, isn't progressive economics. I think the opposite of neoliberalism is vibrant democracy. We're one of the richest countries in the world. We can waste money on anything we want. Well, we can. Look at the New South Wales government. They want to waste billions of dollars on football stadiums. What a fantastic country to live in. Because if we could waste it on that, imagine if we wasted it on health or wasted it on education. We're one of the richest countries in the world and we have a democratic... I'd say obligation to debate what we want more of and what we want less of. The real power of neoliberalism was to tell us we didn't have any choices, that we had to cut taxes, that we had to cut spending, that we had to deregulate. And all I say to people is, Sweden exists. <laughs> <laughs> it's real, I've been there. <laughs> right? They have high wages and they have high taxes and they sell Volvos to China. This is not top secret. Like Margaret Thatcher's quote, it's not top secret, but somehow our public debate has been captured with these crazy ideas. So I'll wrap up there. I wrote the essay to give people something to think about. I hope I have. Uh, I, think that, I think that we're at a turning point in not just Australian, but global public debate about these things. Donald Trump is not a neoliberal. <laughs> Tony Abbott is not a neoliberal. Malcolm Turnbull is not a neoliberal. There aren't any left. The idea is still around, but no one's prosecuting it. None of them believe it for a second. They're all out trying to spend money on popular things, and they're out trying to introduce regulation on unpopular things. That's why they've got a bank tax, and that's why we're banning live animal exports. It's got nothing to do with neoliberalism. It's got a lot to do with populism. And populism, I think, is just a pejorative for democracy. I like the idea that our parliament would respond to something that tens of millions of people want. About time, I'd say. Thank you very much. That's been episode 27 of Follow the Money, brought to you by the Australia Institute and recorded in our Canberra offices at the official launch of the June quarterly essay on the 5th of June 2018. Richard's quarterly essay, Dead Right, is available from all good news agents or at quarterlyessay.com.au. If you would like to donate to our end of financial year appeal to help make sure the Australia Institute can continue its research and that Richard can write his next essay or book, please visit our website at tai.org.au. Thanks to three generous donors, David Morowitz and his Social Justice Fund and Diana and Brian Snape. Every donation you make will be matched until we reach our target of $40,000. That means if you donate $50 our research fund will receive $100. I've asked our economists and they've assured me that that's a great deal. You can subscribe to Follow the Money on iTunes or wherever you get your favourite podcasts. And please do leave us a rating. It helps other people to discover the podcast. We're also on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. 
My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T and Richard Dennis is R-D-N-S underscore T-A-I. This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy. Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum composed our title track and you can find more of his music at pulseandthrum.com. Thanks for listening. Oh,